relatively small, 28 businesses, 100 staff, a uh, little bit less than a uh, million dollars in retail demand, um, and not very retail oriented. There are a lot of um, service businesses there, uh, which actually could be um, could give us some good opportunities for growth of the service sector in the future. I also took a look at how many cars uh, on an average day are traveling back and forth along Main Street uh, 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 through the core city. 16,000 cars a day, assuming that that each of those cars represents a household and there's only one person in each car, um, they're generating $128 million in retail demand. It's like a river of money, of potential sales flowing, flowing through um, the district down Main Street and there's kind of a breakout of where, that, uh, where the expenditures are. Um, Lexington at the intersection up there is getting about 20,000 a day. So uh, even more as people are coming from sort of western areas of the community over, over this way. Um, I also looked at the census tracts uh, around uh, this area. A census tract is an area of about 500 to 1,000 households whose demographic characteristics are more or less homogenous. They kind of hang together that way. And so you can kind of figure out, you know, which, which census tract borders on which piece of the district in terms of convenience-oriented retail that there might be opportunities for. And you can see sort of what the, what the lineup is. Um, of how much market demand that there might be there from people who are within, you know, a couple of minutes walking distance um, of portions of, uh, of, the, of the center city area. Um, with retail, there are always choices to make. Um, there are always different directions that, that you can pursue. Uh, some communities like locally owned uh, businesses, some prefer national retailers, some want to be national or international destinations, some want to be community serving districts. There's no right or wrong answer. What really uh, counts is what the community wants. And one of our jobs during the charrette is to hear from you, what kind of a place do you really want the center city to be? You know, do, do, you want, do you want there to be more sort of mega attractions that draw people in? Do you want it to be more community serving? Do you want more entertainment? Um, and then we can test the market viability um, of those different things. And I can tell you from the research I've done so far that I think it will be possible to find market viability in almost anything that you might want. There's really a strong market here currently kind of leaving the community that I think we can harness uh, and bring back in addition to building on the, on the outside markets that you're already attracting. Um, it'll be very important to sort of carefully define market-based strategies for each sub-district um, in the downtown, uh, in the center city area, and, and really stick to that market-based strategy when you're figuring out what kinds of events to do, what kinds of businesses to develop, um, uh, timing for everything. It should serve as your litmus test uh, to make sure that your, um, that your decisions stay really frosty. Uh, my own sense right now, and this is something I welcome feedback on because, you know, what do I know? I'm not from here, um, is that uh, you have the opportunity to create sort of a design district, not a market, but a design district, a collection of design-oriented businesses, many of which you already have in place um, along this Main Street corridor, kind of bleeding from, this, uh, from the, the downtown mixed-use district uh, and up along Main Street and some of the peripheral streets. Um, you have a lot of uh, architects, interior designers, home furnishing stores um, that you could, could kind of make and brand into um, a design district. And I'll show you a couple of examples in a second. Um, this area here might lend itself well to sort of entertainment, to clubs, uh, because you have uh, buildings and passageways that are well suited uh, to those kinds of uses. Um, dining kind of up in this uh, upper part towards uptown. Um, in here, and again, these, these, don't, these aren't rigidly separated, they kind of comb together and, inter, and interweave, but it's nice to have uh, nodes that you can begin to cluster businesses around. Um, and then sort of cool retail and services um, as you spread out along, along Lexington. And then over towards uh, the university, looking at more of an innovation center uh, of ways to incubate new businesses, to accelerate business development, uh, get high point students who are graduating to stick around in the community and start businesses here. Um, get them seated, and then maybe even bring them um, into the downtown core uh, once, they're, once they're up and running. Um, a couple of examples of design districts. This is one from a town in Indiana, which I can, you probably want to pronounce from the name on the sign, Carmel. They pronounce it Carmel. It's kind of hard to do, but Carmel. Um, it's a town of about 80,000 people, a little smaller than you, and they have this booming um, design district um, in the downtown. This is one in Solana Beach, California, which is a relatively small town in the northern part of San Diego County called the Cedrus Avenue Design District, and it has you know, garden shops and restaurants, and it's got a winery. 
um, lots of different home furnishings businesses that attract people on a regional basis throughout the year, not just for a special event like a market, but on an ongoing basis. I think it's gonna be important to develop some new tools and resources here to stimulate and support business development and growth. And there are lots of possibilities there um, that we'll talk about as uh, the week progresses, like pop-ups, businesses that um, get free rent in a vacant storefront for a few months to kind of test their market, test their product, generate some buzz in the meantime, and see if they can take roots. This is one that's a permanent one called Grand Opening. Uh, and every three months it changes to a new pop-up. This is when it was an auction house. This was when it was a ping pong parlor. Uh, this is a town in South Carolina uh, that has an annual uh, pop-up uh, business plan competition and the two businesses that win the business plan competition get, get six months of free rent. Um, and all but one of them so far has signed um, a long-term lease uh, after that six month incubation period. Forgivable loans, deferred loan repayment program, tax credits, historic and new markets. You have a phenomenal opportunity here in North Carolina um, with a great state tax credit to couple the 20% federal rehab credit and the 20% state credit for income generating properties. In essence, that's 40% of the equity that you might need to rehab a building, um, a unique opportunity to take advantage of. And with the passage of the Jobs Act last um, April, it'll, it, it'll be possible within a few months for individuals in the community to invest between two and $10,000 each in locally owned businesses that are, that, are, that are seeking equity investors so that you can actually support with your dollars uh, as an investment, as a shareholder, businesses that are important um, to make the district succeed as a whole. Um, incubators and accelerators could be a possibility for um, the university area, um, and there are a bunch that are popping up around the country all of a, su a sudden. In essence, they're like sort of co-working spaces uh, that pair with them, with just the co-working space, um, a training program, mentors, seed capital, and access to venture capitalists to help get those businesses really accelerated into a fast track and growing. This is one in DC called The Fort, um, that pairs with a venture capitalist called Fortified Ventures. This one you may know is the, um, uh, uh, the Triangle Startup Factory uh, in Raleigh. Uh, there it is. Uh, La Cocina is sort of a business incubator for food-oriented businesses um, in San Francisco. Um, my last words of sort of guidance would be to break these big transformations, bringing in sort of reshaping the, the retail composition of a district. Break, it, break those big transformations into small chunks and divide the work um, as broadly as you can. There's no one person or entity that can really make this happen. It's gonna take the cooperation of a broad range of public and private sector organizations, agencies, property owners, business owners, civic clubs, school organizations, everybody doing the part that they are best suited for, that they have the unique skills for uh, to make this work. Um, and finally, never stop innovating. Always be thinking outside the box um, about ways that you can really uh, revolutionize uh, how High Point, with its great assets of this international market, this fabulous university, the young people in the community, the capital that you have here, how you can put those pieces together um, and do something that's really gonna knock it out of the ballpark. Um, I'm only gonna be here for part of the charrette. If you have thoughts and ideas about retail development that you'd like me to, to know, that you wanna share with me, please email me, kennedy at cluegroup.com, or pass your ideas on uh, to the charrette team and they'll be sure that I, that I get them. Thank you very much. Okay, now we have uh, Kennedy's presentation and mine were not coordinated, but they happen to be coordinated because it's the way the world is going. And we have the same attitude towards observing uh, trends and also uh, to um, tailor actually what the prospects are to the place. What I'd like to do for the first few uh, for the first few images is to, if in fact the first images are what I think are the first images, because remember I haven't seen this, um, 
what I'd like to do is actually position this peculiar place of yours so that you understand not only what its assets are, but what its liabilities, what makes it difficult. I think I'm going to start with the difficulties uh, to have a general sort of, you know, rise in spirit as we end. Uh, <laughs> this charrette uh, is, as I said, an in, uh, a, a proposition in which the group is intelligent, the individuals are deficient in knowledge. Uh, you are terribly important, but it is not a political campaign. It is not a matter of convincing as many people as possible. What we need to have are representative people. We need people of different kinds, the different kinds that you have. We are, uh, we are for some reason, charrettes are, are usually short on the young people, uh, young people attending. And so young people, as you know, are the people who will be 35 and 40 by the time the kinds of wonderful places that we are describing are working. However, if they do not show up, and uh, we are studying now as to why they tend to not participate, and we might get better at this in the future, you can still represent them. Because those of you who do participate know young people, uh, and uh, by the way, it's not good enough to have been a young person, you understand that? <laughs> because the young people are different than you are. You have to know a real, actual young person, uh, uh, preferably not a child, because you have lenses for that. But you know, we know in a college town like this one what they're like. So let me start with uh, some of the maps that we have. This is the area that we have to work with. We have plenty of maps that, and this seems to be some kind of zoning code. Remember that what we're doing is building on a prior master plan, which called for this kind of detailed plan. There was the, the, the map that, that Kennedy had up there is the prior plan. We're also researching actually a plan that was done in the 1940s and a plan that was done in 1926. And you can really learn a lot from that. Uh, sometimes we find the best ever plan is the 1926 plan. Because the, first of all, it was, it was the town in its ideal form before the automobile disaggregated it. What was this place meant to be? And also because uh, in some ways, we are again a relatively impoverished nation. One of the things that happened in 2008 was that we were alerted to certain permanent conditions. And by the way, the real estate bubble is not part of it. The real estate bubble will blow away, and we're going to have a real estate market again. What it did reveal is, in fact, that a lot, trillions of dollars had disappeared, and those which had not disappeared are now committed to people growing older and their pensions and health needs. So we don't have money to throw around. One of the things that came up earlier today were certain people who were actually coming up with plans, big money plans, you know, not like Kennedy was showing. And those big money plans, the big loans, the, you know, the large gesture, the silver bullet that will solve everything, that's 20th century. You know, those days are gone. It's different now. And we think it's different and better. I think this, we, something went terribly off the rails uh, following the 1990s, perhaps starting the 1980s, and we're reverting back to another America. Now, that other America is much more entrepreneurial. It's lighter. It's smaller, smaller, younger, younger people can work in it, and we're going to speak about what allows the young people again to start these stores. Now, this is your biggest problem and your biggest asset. <laughs> this is what happens twice a year, okay? <laughs> There is something called a spike. A spike <laughs> is not a good thing. Retailers don't like spikes. They don't like any kind of spikes. You know, they don't like when the kids go home in the summer. In Florida and in, and in the Cape, in Cape Cod, they don't like the seasons. They want to even things out so that they can actually make a living. What they do is there are some retailers that have to make their life, and actually I think there are quite a few here in High Point, who really make the bulk of their profits essentially in a two to four week period. So this for me is a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare. Now what's peculiar about this one is that it doesn't even, it's not even like this. It doesn't sustain this level and then spike. It actually goes to nothing. And people remind me, there's a shoulder, there's a shoulder when people set up and dismantle, but it's very short. It's virtually impossible to live off that. All that is good for is fame and tax base. We need to do something else. Now, 
The, just to give you some examples, this is what happens if you get a stadium. If you get a whole bunch of baseball games, you get spikes that last for weekends and so forth. It's something like that. Even that, the baseball field or silver bullet, it's not good enough. You know, because there's too many spaces in between in which no one is buying. Or perhaps even all you have are hot dog <coughs> vendors. And then there are the standard, let's say, something which is a relative ideal, which are movies. Every weekend the crowd comes in. Movies are pretty good. Now they're rough, you know, they're, there are times you have to even them out with other kinds of stores. But you can see the difference. Now normally what I work with is this problem. Imagine, I wish we had this problem <laughs> of the weekend spike. You know, we have absolutely, we have a, gr a, a problem. It's almost like a, the, a cartoon of a problem. You know, what can we do to make life impossible for the planner and the retailer? <laughs> this is the town population with schools. You know, this is the school in session, out in session, summer, in and out like that. And the retailers feel it. Everybody feels it. This too is a problem. Ideally, what we need to do is to have a mixed-use town, okay? Even, even, uh, even when you have a city, like, you know, Manhattan in Midtown that is primarily office, you would be surprised how empty Midtown is, which is pr because everybody is actually in the southern tip of the island. Even Manhattan, with its density and its relative amount of mixed-use, really has these terrible spikes. And the restaurants are closed in Midtown. It's a remarkable thing to watch. You have a terrific problem. So we have to work with essentially what we have. We have to, we're working very much against, uh, in, in a situation. Now, if I may add something to this. If the, not that I intend to solve it, but I wanna just uh, actually, uh, 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 actually you need to understand the difficulty. When the furniture market withdraws, it's not like they liberate the shops so that, you know, so that we can conventionally fill them. The shops are still sealed and ready for the next market. So we're arriving at a place in which the, the bulk of the downtown is actually paying leases and yet shut. So what do we do? What are the quarters? Like where do we put these shops? We need to incubate them out of nothing. And one of the few assets that are actually empty are the parking lots. You know, you say, where do we do anything? Well, the shops aren't available. What's left is the parking lots. And one of the things you'll see us develop over this week is an extremely creative attitude towards uh, guerrilla retail and guerrilla entertainment activities in your parking lots. So that's one of the things that are forthcoming. We've, we've sort of been backed into this. Okay, now, that is about as, that's the extent of our bad news. Let's talk about our good news. We have this college that raises, this university that raises everyone's spirits. Because actually, in despite everything, despite China, despite, you know, the devastation of American furniture making, you know, by cheap labor all over the world, we have High Point University. And people cling to this place with great hope. One of the things that we want to do is get the kind of the lesson of high point, the fact that things can be done in the teeth of difficulty and very quickly. So it's really this spirit that we want. Now, I made a mistake once of actually saying the problem with the students in high point is that they are so comfortable here within their campus that they never come downtown. And of course, the newspaper loved that one. <laughs> and I think, uh, um, frankly, I was delighted when those articles came out because it made many of you come here because you think it's going to be controversy. It is going to be controversial. This is going to be highly controversial, but it's not going to be controversial that way. It's going to be controversial lots of other ways, but not that one, but I'm glad you're here. Uh, the thing about High Point is that there are 5,000 students, mostly well healed, and actually they don't go downtown. And you know what the problem is? It's not that there's a fence. They can get out and come back whenever they want. Okay, is not that there's a distance, because it's bicycling distance, it's certainly car distance. The problem is that there's nothing to do downtown. Okay, there's nothing to do. So what's happened is that this university has had to internalize an unusual number of its activities that normally would occur in a college town because there isn't a college town. Now we're gonna do something about this because the university is expanding towards two shopping centers to the north. 
you know, both the strip shopping center, which they've reached already, they've also bought the mall. So there's a prospect for actually getting a college town, you know, in that direction. But in the meantime, we need to work the downtown, and here I'd like to bring up an issue. You are incredibly well located in this state. Okay, you're incredibly well located. The highways go through everywhere. I didn't understand why this wasn't chosen the capital. You know, look at it. Where else would you like to be except High Point? That makes a great deal of difference. Now, that's in the macro scale. In the, macro, in the micro scale, you have all the usual bypasses and suburban sprawl that doesn't allow, that doesn't cause people to come downtown. Although I am more and more becoming alert to the 16 to 19,000 cars per day that go up and down your main street. What is their uh, economic potential? You told us earlier today. Those cars have a, remember you, you said it was million, tens of millions of dollars. Okay. If each, if those cars are driven by a single individual, the household of that, in, of those, of those 16 to 20, 19,000 individuals, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your number, is about 120 million purchasing power. Okay, so there's all this, there's a river of cash driving, driving through. Okay, this is purchasing power. So basically, you haven't been fully bypassed yet. So on the micro scale, if you had something to sell and something to offer and something that was large enough to attract people, you have it. Now, are you large enough? The problem is that you're not that large and you have two contenders north of you. The pretty darn good Greensboro and the pretty terrific Winston-Salem. And they've been adding for a very long time to get to where they are. Playing catch up is difficult because they're so close. You know, once you get in a car, an extra 10 or 20 minutes is nothing. Now, if you can catch people walking or bicycling, then they, there's a premium to proximity. But once you get in the car, that bond is broken and you simply go to the best place. You go to the best restaurant, you go to the best Main Street experience. So one of the things that we'd like to do is, yes, deliver some Main Street experience, but we don't want to be a second-rate or third-rate Winston-Salem. I think being, being follow-up is going to fail. You can't be because they're both accessible. If there are two, and Winston-Salem is the best, and let's say Greensboro is the second best, and High Point is the third best, where are you going to choose 90% of the time? You're going to go to the best and second best. And that's just futility. That's throwing stones into the water. There won't be a ripple left. We have to do something other that we can be the best at. Right? And that's actually the lesson of High Point University. It doesn't, it doesn't compete in every way, but that which it offers, it is the best at possibly in the world. You know, that was sort of the brilliance of the marketing of this place. So let's find out what we have. There is something called the driving distance, and there are conventions of driving distance. Some say people will get, if you can accommodate people for an entire afternoon or an entire evening. By the way, if all you have is 10 minutes activity or just dinner, People will drive 25 minutes. But if you have something that will cover an evening or a Saturday morning or a Saturday afternoon, people will drive an hour, an hour and a half, two hours. Okay, it extends. By the way, if you have an entire weekend, people will drive four hours. Resorts are calculated as, as four-hour drives. Our resort, Seaside, is, is within four hours drive of Atlanta, Birmingham, etc., and people think nothing of driving four hours for a weekend. What we want to do is to get to that threshold situation where High Point has enough, enough that people will come for that entire evening or entire Saturday afternoon. And that is very easily a 75 minute radius. So let's look at the 75 minute radius. Here it is. Okay, here's High Point here. This is 60 minutes, this is 75. Each of these is a college. Do you know that of all the radiuses of the, how many colleges is it, Drew? I mean, uh, Ben? Do you remember how many colleges are here? Well, I don't remember, and actually this is an incredibly out of, what happened to the focus? I assure you it's a beautiful slide here. Okay. <laughs> what you're seeing here is, sorry, what you're seeing here is the list of colleges. Out in the outer circle, there are 335,000 students. Okay, just, just please assimilate that. There are 335,000 students within a 75 minute drive. There's 225,000 students within a one hour drive. You are the center of a world 
of students. It's absolutely extraordinary. This is way beyond High Point University. Actually, you're in the center of a cloud of exactly the kind of people, exactly the kind of people that are the future and that was actually driving virtually everything that Kennedy showed. It's a tremendous asset. Those are the ones we need to bring here. And the way we're going to do that is to make this a much cooler place in their terms, not necessarily in our terms, although I do enjoy such places, in their terms, we're going to make this a much cooler place than Winston-Salem and to. We're going to make the place that, that they go with their parents to when they want di the parents to buy them dinner. If they want to have fun, they'll come here. Okay? And that's going to take a different point of view or a different standard than you have now. This cannot be done. This, does, this cannot be done under prop proper protocols. Okay, the way that you permit things, the way that you incubate, the way that things are done in High Point are not going to work for the young people. Now, in a subsequent presentation, I'm going to explain the sequence by which places are revitalized by the young people. And it has a lot to do with the level of bureaucracy that they have to overcome. At the moment, you have a very high level of bureaucracy, exceedingly high. That only works when the profits are also exceedingly high. People will put up with a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of extra expense if the profit is high. Right now, the differential, the basic, the, 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 the value of your real estate is much too low. Only those people who are very young are able to basically appreciate it, and I mean appreciate it in both ways. They like it and they make it more valuable, but you have to let them act. And at the moment, they can't act. Okay, so much of what we're doing that's most exciting is working with the very young people. And you know what? They know parking lots. If you're not going to give a storefront, we know how to make uh, cool outdoor bars, cool outdoor music, cool outdoor scenes, high management, low design. Very little building, very little management, low design. And then we have the mall, which is part of our agenda. The mall is, you know Jane Jacobs, the great urban theorist who said that the great thing about cities that cause businesses to, businesses to, uh, to rise is cheap space. That's her words, cheap space. We need cheap space. People who are incubating businesses, and what happens in that mall is that it's actually owned at a very low level. And although I know, I know you have mills here and there, you have one of the largest possible business accelerators in the world in the form of that mall. And you're going to be seeing that we're going to propose that as something that is actually unique nationally. You know, one of the largest places and the pro hopefully one of the most exciting places because it's full of craft. You know, these craftsmen that you have that live here that make things with their hands, not just techie things, not just virtual things, not just selling things that, other, that others make, not just entertainment, not just frivolities, not just Twitter, but things things made with their hands, and that satisfaction is the other thing we want to tap into. What we'd like to do is tap into the efficiency and the vision of High Point University, the 335,000 students after they graduate, the ones that you lose, the ones that you educate, and then they leave. We want to tap into them, and then we want to also bring this wonderful, wonderful tradition of craft and keep it alive and transmit it to the next generation that really is quite desperate, not just to buy handmade things, but to make handmade things and to incubate that. And that's really the largest, the largest idea that we have. So remember this diagram, this incredible diagram of the number of students. Okay, so we have Kennedy spoke, so we have some ideas for here, for the downtown. We have some ideas for the uptown we have some ideas for the extension of the campus, which I'll show you principally later, and we have some ideas for the mall, which is you know, the, the famous dead mall. By the way, nothing dishonorable about dead mall. There are 3,000 of them in the United States. Uh, dead, I mean. Uh, uh, this is a city with beautiful neighborhoods, as usual, uh, first-rate residential areas with dying downtowns. We have to remember that the first generation of neighborhoods are really the best. Those who have the great houses of the 1920s in the great subdivisions of the 1920s 
really win out. It's much better than anything that's available in the suburbs. It's just the retail, the main street that collapsed. These are various drawings that people have put in. I don't know why. Okay, now this is an analysis. This is an analysis we, we do like a diagnostic. You know when you go to a doctor, they don't even think about it. They do your blood pressure, look at your eyes and so forth. One of the things that we do when we arrive, we look at the walking experience, both whether the sidewalk exists and just the experience of the frontage of the building next to you. What's it like to walk down a place? And you rate the experience. We rate it as first rate, you know, which is normally a, a wide sidewalk under a tree with a really interesting store to look at. That's first rate. That gets five stars. Very desirable. And then gradually it erodes. You know, it gets a little bit less, and less good and a little bit less good until finally the bottom four, the bottom four are parking lots, blank walls, and parking garages. Guess what you excel at? Guess what this is like? <laughs> the regional center, if not the state center, of empty parking lots, empty parking garages, and blank walls. It's almost impossible to take a photograph that doesn't have to be edited, <laughs> to not have something negative in it. You cannot put together three blocks of first-rate experience. By the way, and I'm counting when the storefronts are open. If I actually had to find uh, a place that had storefronts that actually were selling something, I couldn't put together half a block, not half a block. Okay. Frankly, the surreal part of this is the very high tax base, the general sort of good feeling you have among the people, and the incredibly bad pedestrian experience, which is, of course, what the young people want and what the retailers demand. This is an analysis. Uh, can't believe the quality of this projector. I'm bringing my own. I mean, I love the, the Versailles. But I think the projector is a piece of junk, okay? <laughs> Let me just say it, okay? Because it's ruining my drawings. Okay, very generously, very generously, these are the decent places to walk, okay? In another city, let's say of quality, like New Orleans, there wouldn't be anything good here, okay? So you have, we have an incredible deficiency of frontage. And now that's the bad news. The good news is, that if you can manage so much as two and a half blocks of decent continuous frontage, you become a famous place. Many of the places that we really appreciate, for example, the famous Winter Park in Florida, two and a half blocks of decent walking place. And people from all over Florida come to spend the weekend in Winter Park. So it doesn't take that much to make a great place. So one of the things we're gonna deliver is a, try to deliver, is a conventional main street of approximately a quarter mile long. We're gonna find a place, we have to move out the people who are leasing it and shutting it down and provide a pedestrian experience of that kind. At least one, possibly two, okay? Now this is, uh, if, if I, th as I said, this looks pretty spotty and I'm being kind. I mean, this is the kind of plan. Let, let me just give you a feeling for how we calibrate it downwards. We actually have the facade of the mall as a positive. <laughs> Pretty low. Okay. Now, you also have an awful lot of discard of, of uh, 19, uh, 1950s ideas that work for cars and don't work for retail. Now, cars are great for retail. You know, they bring the people. But if they're moving quickly, they don't see the shops, they don't, they can't actually see what's being sold, and they destroy the pedestrian experience of those who are on the sidewalk. We are continually clocking people on Main Street at 48 miles an hour. Okay, your Main Street is radically over-designed. But radically, ra over design, I mean too wide, there's no friction, no impediments, there's nothing. 48 miles an hour is an extremely hostile experience. You actually don't, aren't going to be killed, okay? It's not that they're going to hit you, but it feels awful to be there. The ideal is under 30 miles an hour. And by the way, the capacity does not go down under 30. The throughput, the number of cars that are going through a screen at, a, at, at, at under 30, actually increases because the spacing is less. So one of the things we're going to do 
is we're going to actually put the road, when we have terrific engineers from Florida, from California to come in who are the experts, we're going to put the road, we're going to put your roads on a road diet, what's called a road diet to slow them down. If you don't do that, you can forget about it. Okay, I'm going to say a lot of these things. I'm not going to push very hard. You know, what we're going to do is we're going to tell you, you want this to succeed, you have to do that. And if you don't do that, I don't care how many wires you bury, I don't care how much you subsidize the retail, it ain't going to work. And I'm going to be very blunt about that. Okay? And I'm going to become, I'm just going to tell you, it just it isn't going to work, don't get excited. And I will be there to tell you. You have to put Main Street on a road diet. And we've redesigned it. Fortunately, there's a lot of money to bury wires. And by the way, you know why you bury wires? I bet you don't know. It's not to bury the wires per se, it's to plant trees. Do you know that the current system buries the wires in such a way that you can't plant trees? So at the very least, we have to fix that. We have to fix that. The other thing we we, that, that actually we find is that you have a very, very large area where you're burying, a, a, a great deal of length where you bury the wires. It's not necessary. About a third of it is utterly hopeless. It'll never be nice. It doesn't even want to be nice, <laughs> OK? It's strip shopping center. It wants to have cars in front. It wants to have visibility. They hate trees because it blocks their sign. So if we actually triage and take that third away that doesn't even want to be improved and don't even bother to bury the wires and bring that money in to the half mile that actually has hope, we can do a much better job. So we're actually adjusting. We're increasing the ambition of, in terms of quality and lowering it in terms of length. Another thing that you'll hear more and more about is old style traffic engineering is a lot of one way pairs, a lot of one way streets. One way streets disorient you. Okay, you're always on the wrong streets, not where you want to go. Second, it allows the cars to speed, to speed much more. There's nothing that creates more friction that slows you up than the car coming in the opposite direction. You can really speed it up when it's in one direction. But you know, one of the biggest problems is you actually get the retailers that we're attempting to bring to life they only get the morning trade. If it's in one direction or the only the evening trade, if it's in the other direction. So you have streets that are, have commercial potential that are only getting half the trade. Now if you had two ways, you would get the morning trade and the evening trade. And so we need to take out, take out some, not all, because it doesn't matter in many of your streets, we need to take out some of your one-way one pairs. By the way, it's costly. It's not even costly, it just costs. There are costs involved, but it won't work unless you do that. Uh, some of the, the, the two downtowns, the downtown here, the uptown here, and uh, this is a drawing of your buildings. By the way, uh, when you look at this, do you realize how gapped this is? You know, this is really, uh, this is a, uh, a lot of parking. <laughs> okay, we've, we've diagrammed it. I don't know whether it's here, the parking, but we've diagrammed it. And uh, now you do have, are you sure this can't be focused? How do you watch Lawrence of Arabia here? <laughs> okay, this is a beautiful piece of Main Street. Okay, you know where this is? I'm sorry, I've got my little crib sheet here because I never pronounce anything correctly Southern. Um, this is Kivet. Okay, so this is Kivet, and uh, Kivet has a terrific double row of, of stores. This is a very bad photograph on a very bad day, but they're really good shops. Almost all of them are committed to furniture, and many of them are shut. Okay, we need to do some kind of trade to liberate this for a conventional piece of retail. And by the way, this is a lot. Do you realize that the length of this double block is the exact length, length of the mall? Okay, this is actually the correct length for a shopping experience. You will actually go down and you will go up and you'll do both blocks and be really happy and you need, no, don't need more. It's the standard issue length. So we're gonna try very hard uh, working with anyone, we can, with everyone who is involved, including the including the, uh, the, the, the furniture market in order to actually see whether we can decant these people here into the mall and liberate that. So that's one agenda. It's mostly management. 
okay, these are your buildings. Uh, these are the, the important spots. We've identified the important spots. I'm not going to go into detail on this, but I will say that in general, the weight, this of course is the central square, this is the old big building, this is the new one, and this is the great canopy. By the way, what a terrific in investment. That canopy is used, is one of the things that's used all year round. It's a, it's a really good piece of very light design. Uh, it doesn't fall out of uh, fashion. It's a, it's a, it was one of these designs that look good, will continue to look good. So obviously this is the center of something, also that's where the Shakespeare Theater is. Generally, the bulk of the, of the um, is on commerce in this direction. It's much spottier in this direction. Do you, do you have any idea how miserable this street is? <laughs> you should try it. Okay, I do not subscribe to the theory that some people have offered that the more miserable the outside experience is, the more, the more, the more time the buyers spend indoors. Okay, I don't think anything punitive works with Americans. And one of, the, one, of the, one of the things that we, one of the ideas that we have, since there's very little traffic on this street, very, very little, is to actually take it and make it one of your green streets. You know, just a really green and advanced, hydrologically advanced, light imprint green streets, a delight to be in. Uh, I think that will help the mark. Now, over here, starting with the white gridded building, you know, the building, the high rise that is now empty, with the, the plaza where the good restaurant used to be. By the way, I don't know the names yet. There is a, and, and going over to where uh, two of the showrooms that remain open year round, this is the stickly I happen to remember. There's a series of open, of storefronts and open parking lots, a whole sequence of them in this direction, which are uniquely well shaped. They're small, they feel like this room, you know, this, is a, this room feels good, it's small. The big parking lots are a misery. The little ones feel like little squares. They have a great deal of enclosure. You can actually pave them when, with nice stuff. You can actually fill them with people and they'll feel lively and crowded. We've identified a sequence of them here. And on here, we are going to propose the kind of place in which at certain times of the year, perhaps you begin incubating it the first Saturday of the month or the first Friday of the month and then you go Thursday and Saturday and you begin sending out to all the young people that the coolest scene within two hours, and I'm talking all the way to Duke, all the way to North Carolina, the coolest scene is happening here. Now this is already being done in Miami in a place called Wynwood and it's very interesting, very low cost, very cool, low design, high management, you know, with a lot of cooperation from the city and I'm gonna be bringing that more and more. It, these are the kinds of places that turn blank walls into assets. You know, that turn chain link fences into assets. You know, just with really good lighting, but above all, really good management. Now, when I keep speaking of management, let me mention one more asset that you have. This place, the, the fact that you can feed and house and transport 80,000 people for a week means that you should have been ch in charge of the D-Day invasion. <laughs> okay, because I don't, that many troops were not landed in Normandy all week. Okay, you do an amazing thing. One of your assets, remember I mentioned several assets, being in the center of, a, you know, being in the center of 335,000 students, basically a highly spirited civic uh, commitment the people who meet, you know, who meet and care about this place, even when there isn't a crisis. You also have the craftsmen, but you also have a series of